Welcome to the Grow Your Independent Consulting Business Podcast. I'm Melissa Lieberman, a fellow IC and business coach. On this podcast, I teach you to become a consistently booked independent consultant without becoming a pushy salesperson or working 24 seven. If I can do it, you can too. Listen on to find out how. Welcome to episode 137 of the Grow Your Independent Consulting Business Podcast. I'm Melissa Lieberman. I'm so happy you're here today. And we'll just start with a little personal update. I hear from a lot of you that you listen to this and like it. So I'll tell you, we just got back from Costa Rica and Nicaragua. We were in the northwest part of Costa Rica. Hopefully my geography is right. We were in the northwest part of Costa Rica And it was maybe 35, 45 minutes from the Nicaraguan border. So there was one day that we had a tour guide and he took us over across the border and into Nicaragua. And I have to tell you, it was incredible. I would go back there on vacation in a heartbeat. It felt safe. There was this incredible colonial town that we went to and kind of this boat ride through these islands. And it was beautiful. And the people were so friendly. And the food was amazing. We went and saw into a volcano, into the crater. Anyway, highly recommend it. So if you need any advice about that part of Costa Rica or Nicaragua, send me an email. I would love to chat with you about it. It's so much fun. Okay, and I am actually recording this on a Friday. And in the middle of volunteering for my son's school, Greek curriculum day. So I went there this morning, and then took a break recording this and then heading back. It's so fun to be an independent consultant, isn't it? To be able to have that flexibility. We're this afternoon, we're having all this huge Greek feast, essentially that I've organized, and I'm really excited about it. So much fun. So I just had to say that because sometimes we don't appreciate or recognize or just take a moment to think about the flexibility that we have and why we have created this business in the first place. So I just want to remind you of that here today as well. All right, with that, let's talk about today's topic. You are not your consulting business. And that might sound a little confusing because the name of this podcast is Grow Your Independent Consulting Business. So likely you are an independent consultant or a solo consultant. And you might even be running a micro firm or a small boutique agency, but it's really easy when we're in this form of a business model to fall into the trap of thinking that you are your business, that I am in my business. It's so easy to fall into this trap. I do it too. And I wanted today, I want to dedicate today's episode to this topic to tell you what the trap is about thinking you are your business, why it's even a problem and how to recognize it, and ultimately how to avoid this situation for you in your business. So you might not even be aware of or thinking of this could be a problem that you're thinking you and your business are one in the same. And that's what I want to bring to your attention today. So the companion resource that goes with to today's episode is my coaching. My coaching, I work with clients like you, independent consultants, who are looking to grow their businesses, to take your business to the next level, whether it's a million dollar practice or a $500,000 practice or $800,000 practice, while at the same time, not sacrificing or compromising on the goals that you have with respect to when you're working and for whom you're working and what you're doing. So if that's something that you want to work on and would love the support of a coach to help you get there further and faster, please book yourself a consult. You can find it at consultmelissa.com. And we'll, it's a no pressure conversation. We'll talk about what your goals are and figure out if coaching would be the next best step for you. So you can find that at consultmelissa.com, M-E-L-I-S-A. I'm missing a lot of letters in my name. There's only six letters. Okay, so with that, let's talk about the agenda for today. And then we'll dive right in. So the agenda very specifically is I'm going to talk a little bit more about what I mean by you are not your consulting business. And then we'll talk about why it's a problem, why it can be a hidden problem in your business that's sabotaging you. 
And I'm going to walk you through just at a high level what the definition is of what I'm talking about. But more importantly, the meat of today's episode is about an example. I know it can be lonely running a consulting business and hearing these examples from other consultants who have fallen into traps that maybe you haven't yet fallen into, or you help you find a trap you're in that you don't even realize. So I'm going to spend the bulk of this episode talking about this example to help highlight this concept for you. If you can't relate to the example exactly, not a problem, just listen to it and think about it in the terms of how this will apply in some way in your own business. And then we'll wrap up today's episode. I'll share with you two very important questions for you to be asking yourself to help you recognize this particular problem in your business where you're thinking you and your business are one in the same. And then I'll give you a three-step formula to redirect out of it. So once you know you've got the problem, how to fix it. Okay, so here we are. Let's talk through at a high level, what do I mean by you are not your business? This might sound incredibly obvious, but so many of us forget or don't recognize the fact that our business is an entity and we are a human. Those are two separate things. Just because you are the person operating your business, wearing all the hats or almost every single hat doesn't make you your business. Your business is a separate entity. It requires revenue and strategic thinking and processes and desirable offers to be successful. And you are the human operating the business and you have cash flow requirements, goals, growth areas, interests, passions, two separate entities. And sometimes these two entities are at conflict. You may have competing priorities. You may have competing interests. And if you don't recognize this, you can put one or both you and your business at risk. Your business at risk of drying up and you at the risk of burning out or not being fulfilled. And so that's why I want to really help you today think about you and your business as two separate things, an entity and a human, and help highlight how you can separate these in order to avoid burnout, avoid making decisions about the strategy and future of your business from the wrong lens. So that is at a very high level what I'm talking about. But I want to illustrate this. It's kind of vague, right? I'm just giving you kind of the principle here. But I want to illustrate what I'm talking about with a very specific story. And it is a real life story from a current client of mine, who I won't give you any identifying details. So don't worry about that. But a current client who was going through a really big challenge, and you may not relate to the challenge exactly. But like I was saying earlier, think about this from the perspective of I'm going to be talking about a channel partner example, but you may even just think about it from an existing client perspective as you're listening to this situation. So here's the situation that I want to share with you that highlights this concept of you are not your business and why that's such an important guiding principle as you're running an independent consulting or a boutique firm. So here's the situation. This consultant took on a channel partner. So I, it was a software company, a niche software provider, and they worked with the same type of clients. So my the consultant, she's my client. We'll just leave it at that. I'm not going to use that word anymore because it gets confusing. The consultant was working with uh, the certain type of client, as was the software provider. So they worked with the same type of clients. They sold to the same type of people in those organizations. And so the software provider had started out their delivery, having a consulting arm internally. So they were providing both the software and the implementation of that software. And they got to the point in the growth of their it's a niche software. So it's a you know, a mid sized company. And they got to the point in their growth pattern that they realized that they wanted to focus on being just a software company and not both a software and services company. And so because of that, they wanted to go out and find a good implementation partner to work with. And the consultant we're talking about today bubbled up and they decided to form a, a collaboration, like a referral agreement, not a partnership, nothing that heavyweight, but a referral process where this niche software provider 
would pull my client in to do a lot of implementation strategy, a lot of implementation change management planning, a little bit of execution, but mostly it was a lot of the of the planning and strategy that they wanted her to help with them with. And so it seemed like a perfect collaboration, right? They're both working with the same types of clients. One is providing software, the other one is providing service. And the consultant wanted leads. So it was a perfect collaboration. The consultant wanted leads and the software company wanted out of the business of implementation. Like I said, they had been implementing on their own and they didn't want to continue building out this entire, really, you know, kind of cost intensive implementation arm. They wanted to focus on their core competency, which was software development. So with that, they formed this collaboration, this referral agreement and dove in. And the consultant started getting the leads a lot more than she was used to having. Her sales activity ramped up. She was talking to leads fairly regularly. But the the process, that sales process wasn't going anywhere. And so when the software company had engaged with her or had partnered up with her, they had told her, you know, what their implementation flow looked like and what their deal flow looked like and how much money they were making and had given her a high level understanding of their business. And so she was shocked that she wasn't converting any of these leads. They had been converting the leads and she wasn't. And so she just started becoming more and more disheartened with this process. And so she really took a step back and started trying to figure out what is the challenge here? What is going on? And her conclusion at the time, this was before she found me, her conclusion at the time was that she was bad at selling. She couldn't accomplish the same kind of outcomes that the software company was accomplishing when they were selling the same services. And so it must mean that she's bad at selling. So she's reading a bunch of books and taking a bunch of webinars and trying to figure out how to desperately trying to figure out how to fix her sales process. And in the meantime, she's second guessing herself, why on earth would her close rate be 0% when the software company had said how successful they had been at selling these same exact types of services? And what was wrong with her? And then she layering on top of it, she's worrying about What is the channel partner thinking about her? She doesn't want them to think she's incompetent or that she doesn't know how to sell something and that ultimately the partnership dissolves because of it. And this incredible opportunity that she had uncovered evaporates and she's losing sleep over this. And so she came to me with this situation to get help on what to do. And she was really at the crossroads. She realized she was at a place where She was taking up a lot of her time. It was distracting her from her core business and she needed to figure out how to fix it. And so that's when she came to me and we started working together. And as we did so, what came to light is that as she was executing on these leads that this company was giving to her and going down a sales process with these leads, she was trying to recreate the same exact scenario that when that was in place when that software company had these services in house. And she hadn't recognized that there was a difference. Her mind was going down the path of everything is wrong with me. I'm terrible at selling. Oh, no, this company's going to see how terrible I am at selling. And I better fix me versus going down the path of let me figure out what's different about this scenario. What's different about the scenario when the software company was selling its own services, and now has pivoted to an external person selling the services, which happened to be this consultant we're talking about today, and didn't really spend very much time at all figuring out what needs to be different about the process in order to make it work. How do we introduce and thinking for the software company, how do they bring this consultant in in a way that makes it seamless, that extends the relationship to the consultant, that third party that we're talking about today, that's now taking on the selling and execution of the implementation strategy 
and ultimately delivery. And so this is the crossroads. At the end of the day, the consultant that we're talking about today, she went down the path so quickly, the conclusion so quickly that something was wrong with her, that something was missing with her. She was so focused on fixing her missing skills and her lack of ability to sell and her worry about what this would do to her reputation that it didn't even dawn on her to think about, wait a second, there's something different here. I can't expect the same results, the same close rate, the same numbers, the same everything using essentially the same process that they were using because there are new variables here. Now there's two companies instead of one. There's two parties that need to make a relationship with the client instead of one. There needs to be some seamless integration of the software company and this consultant we're talking about and a little bit of almost embedding in order to make this a seamless process and set this consultant up to be more successful with selling. But she hadn't even considered that because she made it about her, this problem with her process about her. And so today I want to really emphasize, highlight for you this challenge because so many consultants face this exact challenge where we think of ourselves and our business as one in the same. And why this matters so much is if this particular consultant had kept going down the path of trying to prove herself as a salesperson to both herself and to the software company that she was competent and capable and successful, that is a very different solution than going down the path of look, taking a step back and saying, this isn't about me proving myself. This is about me figuring out, is this channel going to work? And what do I need to make it work? Or is this not the best channel after all? You know, in this case, for this consultant, when she put her business owner hat on, it helped to separate out her desire to get better and prove herself and do anything at all costs to get a close rate, at least somewhere in the ballpark of what that software company had. That's her drive to figure it out. You likely have that too. We do as consultants, right? We want to figure things out. We want to understand what's wrong and fix it. And sometimes we get so narrow minded because of that. It's also this need to prove, you know, both to herself and to this other software company that she could figure it out, that she was good at sales, that they did pick the right partner, that she picked the right channel partner. It was also part of her ego. You know, it's embarrassing, it's humiliating to not be as successful as you anticipated you would be. But if she kept going down that path, and for you, if you think about a similar situation where you might be going down a path to really prove that you can do something, her business was suffering. Her business was suffering because she was spending so much time and energy trying to solve this problem that she was letting the other parts of her business that were already working kind of wither on the vine. She was diluting herself. And so she was getting herself into this situation where she had no pipeline outside of this channel partner. And she was just hell bent on proving that this model could work with the channel partner. Because right, it feels like a great idea. This channel partner could do all the lead generation, she wouldn't need to worry about it. She would just take these leads and sell them and implement them and do things she loved. It sounds so good. It sounds so good. Of course, she would go down the path of trying to prove herself and be hell bent on proving, you know, figuring this out at all costs. But when you take a step back and separate out, and this is what happened for her, we separated out her from her business. And we said, you know, this doesn't make any sense. You've sold things before, you're good at selling. What is different about the process from when that software company was running it internally? What is different about the way that you're selling now and the relationship you have with the potential client than what it is with your the clients that you find directly? And really thinking about it from the perspective of her business rather than from the perspective of her as her business. So we took that step back and we separated her from her business. And we asked the question, what would a CEO do in this case? 
when a channel partnership isn't creating those forecasted or expected results. And it kind of took the temperature down. It took the need to almost fill up an inadequacy down and allowed her to have more clear thinking. And as she did that, we realized, okay, let's start looking at this process step by step by step. Where is she inserted into the sales process? When that that end client is selecting the software and they need a services arm to bring it live, to plan out the implementation and the strategy of the implementation and the change management and, and ultimately the actual actual configuration and those kinds of things. At what point, maybe, you know, we started realizing she needs to be brought in earlier. She almost needs to be treated as an embedded part of the team rather than this sort of external, uh, let me give you the name of someone who could be really good at this, like a very um, impersonal, a very transactional type of an introduction. We started really thinking about how does this step-by-step-by-step process of these leads how can it be improved? It had nothing to do with her. Now we're looking at her process and this relationship with the channel partner. And so she met with the channel partner and they made adjustments and talked about what they could experiment and test with to improve this process. She became proactive in recommending these things rather than you know sitting in her office worrying about how incompetent they must think she is. She also set some very clear criteria for herself about an exit criteria for this relationship. She realized that it was not healthy for her energy and her ability to think and focus if she was just leaving this as an unending battle to try to solve at any cost, uh, no matter what, and forever until it gets fixed, right? She set herself up a um, five-month process with this particular channel partner to figure out exactly how to make this work. And then at that five month mark, revisit. And it was because she separated herself from her business and the way she was thinking about the two things separated out. So hopefully this example really illustrates for you, even if you don't have a channel partner, if you're thinking about it from a client perspective or the way you're selling, the importance of separating you from your business. If you have challenges in your business and you make them about something that's wrong with you, you're not a good salesperson, you're incompetent, you're incapable, you're not cut out for this, it's going to shut down, cloud, dilute, skew your ability to problem solve for the business itself. So let's bring this back for you and your business. And I want to share with you, I said I would give you a couple of questions that you can be asking yourself to put this particular concept in place in your business. And the first is, where are you confusing or not separating yourself from your business? Where are you thinking you and your business are one in the same? Find five or six answers to that question. And then ask yourself, Where are you trying to prove something to someone? It could be your family, your spouse. It could be your former colleagues in corporate. It could be just to yourself. Where are you trying to prove something? Such as, you know, I can figure this out. I can make this work. Where are you trying to prove something versus making a business decision? I'll give you a few examples here to put this into more context. It might be that you're working with a client, even though you're miserable, trying to prove that you're not a quitter. You don't like this client. Maybe there's nothing even wrong with the client itself and the relationship. You just don't like the nature of the work or the dynamic in the organization. But you keep extending them and working with them, even though you're miserable because you're trying to prove that you're not a quitter, trying to show you're not a quitter. Another example, you might be undercharging because you think it makes you a good person. The amount of money you charge or don't charge have nothing to do with whether or not you're a good person. You might be sticking with a lead generation strategy that you hate, like cold outreach, because you're not someone who fails. So you're just doing it, grinding and grinding because someone told you you should do that. By the way, you don't have to. Just because you want to prove that you're not someone who fails, you are not your business. 
So get really clear with yourself about what are you doing right now that you don't want to be doing or you're doing because you think you need to prove something to someone and know that ultimately this is going to negatively impact your business. If you continue doing these types of things, you inhibit and dilute your ability to think more strategically. You inhibit and dilute your ability to have an open mind about what will work and what you do want to do. You get so mired down into making whatever thing is that you're trying to make work work that you end up making it really difficult to be the CEO and business owner of your company in an effective way. So let's wrap up here today. I shared with you that I would give you the three part formula to fix and avoid this. But what I will say is, I'm going to emphasize fix this or notice it earlier and redirect, let's call it that. The reason why I say it in this way is this is going to happen. This is going to happen. Look, I've been doing this for 11 years. And I fall into this trap myself. The goal is not for you to get to be perfect. The goal is not for you to always be thinking like a CEO and not making it personal. That's not the goal. The goal is really to get good at recognizing it and being able to redirect really quickly and not fall down into this trap where there are times where I work with clients and they tell me, it's almost as if they've had an amnesia. They go down a path for three or six months and they're just so focused on making it happen that they don't even realize what they're doing or take a step back and think about what they're doing. They're so focused on proving something and then they come up for air and it's almost as if they had no idea what just happened. They were so in the weeds. You may relate to this. So when I share with you this three-part formula to quote unquote fix this, what I really mean is we're not looking for perfection here. We're just looking for you being curious to see where is this happening so that you can notice it and head it off before it becomes a problem for you. All right? So step one of this formula is to be aware that when you're mixing up or really thinking about you are your business, thinking in that way of you are your business. A couple of the flags that I would love to share with you to help you notice this, sometimes it's hard to see it for ourselves, right? That's why I personally have a coach myself. She helps me to see what is happening that I cannot recognize because I'm too close to the problem. So the couple of flags here are just notice when you're trying to prove something. And also notice when you're doing something to protect your ego. Look, I wouldn't say I have a big ego. I doubt you are someone who has a big ego. But we do things as humans to protect our ego. And so notice when you're doing that. The second step of this three-part formula is to, once you're aware, put your business owner hat on and question what you're doing and why. Like the example I gave you. I walked you through how we did that for her so you can apply this to yourself. And then finally, make a plan from there with you as the person separated from whatever that plan is. Your business's job is not to make you feel competent or capable or adequate or worthy. As a human, you are those things. Separate that out and think about what you're doing from a business perspective that nothing needs to be proven in order to have a successful business, in order to have a successful strategy, and ultimately to be able to move forward toward reaching your goals in a more simple and easy and light way. All right, my friend, that is what I have for you today. Don't forget that companion resource. It was a lot today that we talked through and this is what I do with my clients. I help them see where they're getting in their own way because we all get in our own way. And you sabotaging or diluting what you're capable of is unnecessary. I would love to help you get to the place where you feel better about your business. You feel better about and recognize that you as a person are not your business and be able to separate that out so it doesn't feel like this constant weight and pressure. So if you're interested in learning more to see if this is a good fit for you, you can go to consultmelissa.com. Again, my name is spelled M-E-L-I-S-A, and I will see you again next week. Take care. 
Thanks for joining me this week on the Grow Your Independent Consulting Business podcast. If you liked today's episode, I have three quick next steps for you. First, click subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to make sure you don't miss future episodes. Next, leave me a review in your podcast app so other independent consultants can find and benefit too. And finally, to put the ideas from today's episode into action, head over to melissalieberman.com for the show notes and more resources to help you grow your consulting practice from your first few projects into a full-fledged business. See you next week.